This paper has a very nice tensile strength. Hmm. It also has a great compressive strength. Wow. This paper must be really strong, right? What you just saw could be an engineer's nightmare. You could build something which is extremely strong, which can easily withstand compression and tension, but it could break very easily under a different kind of stress. So what is this new kind of stress? This seems quite important from the structural point of view, right? Well, this new kind of stress that we're gonna talk about in this video is called shearing. And by the end of this video, we would have familiarized ourselves with this concept of shearing. I think one of the best examples to understand shearing is by taking a book. If you take a thick book like this, again, it's very strong under compression and tension. It's extremely difficult to distort it or deform it by compressing it or by pulling it apart. But notice, just with my fingers, I can easily deform it in a different way. Notice that my fingers over here are putting a force parallel to the surface of the book, this way, and as a result, the papers are sliding past each other. This sliding of papers past each other is what we call as shearing. All right, let's look at it in detail now. Imagine we have a cylinder, a cylinder like this, which is stuck to the ground. Let's say here's the ground, we've stuck it over here this way. And imagine we put a force, we put a force on the cylinder parallel to the cross-sectional area, just like what we did in the book, like this. Now, just like how the book was made up of a lot of pages, we could assume that this cylinder is made up of a lot of cross-sectional planes like this. That's the trick to understanding shearing. Always assume that whatever object you're dealing with is made up of a lot of planes, and make sure those planes are parallel to the force that is acting, or the force that's trying to deform the cylinder. So imagine there are a lot of planes like this. So due to this force, as we saw, just like with the book, the cylinder will deform this way. So it was like this before, now it's like this. Somewhat like this, right? And all the planes have slid past each other, just like the papers did in that book. Now here's one question. Why does it stop? Why does this sliding thing stop? Why doesn't it keep on sliding forever? Well, what must be happening is that the material must be trying to restore it back. So there must be a restoring force acting over here. But what direction is the restoring force acting? Well, if we concentrate on a couple of planes, it'll be easy to understand. So let's say we zoom into a couple of planes, let's say a topmost plane and the plane right below that. If we zoom into that, let's say, so here is a plane a little bit below this, so this is the plane a little bit at the bottom, so this one over here, and let me draw another plane, the topmost plane over here. Let me just put some gap between them so it's easier to, easier to visualize this, all right? So we're zooming in, these are two planes, this is the topmost one, and this one is the one that's right below that. And we're putting a force on the topmost plane this way, and as a result, this plane is sliding past this plane this way sliding past, but it doesn't keep on sliding forever. And the reason for that is as it slides, because of the intermolecular forces, this plane tries to pull it back. So there must be a restoring force acting in the opposite direction this way. And, and as the plane slides more and more, the restoring force increases more and more. Eventually the restoring force equals the external force, and then the whole plane comes into equilibrium. And, th and that's how eventually the whole material comes into equilibrium. Now, if we take this restoring force and divide it by this area, this cross-sectional area, then we will call that kind of stress, remember stress is the restoring force per unit area? So that kind of stress, that stress is called as shearing stress. Shearing stress. So shearing stress is this restoring force, these restor this restoring force divided by the cross-sectional area. So what should come to your mind when you hear the word shearing is planes sliding, planes sliding past each other, all right? This should come to your mind, past each other. 
That's how I like to think about sharing. Now the next thing could be, how do we calculate the deformation? Well, since uh, in shearing, planes are sliding past each other, we could just calculate how much one plane has slid past another. For example, if you take this topmost plane and compare how much it has slid past the bottommost plane, the bottommost pun, notice initially the topmost plane was over here. Here is the bottommost plane. It has, slide, it has sl slid from here to here. So we could say this is the amount of deformation, delta x. But guess what, if you take any other plane, so for example, if you take this plane, then it has only deformed, or it, it is only slid by, slid past by this much amount. So delta x itself is not a good measure because different planes slide by different amount. A better way to measure the deformation would be to calculate how much one plane has slid past another plane, which are a unit distance apart. Let's not just take any two random planes, but only take the ones which are unit distance apart. That would be a great way. So imagine this length, or the distance between this and this plane, let's call that as L. That would be the length, or the initial length of the cylinder. Then, from this we could say, the two planes which are L distance apart, have slid past by an amount delta x. So if you take any two planes which are a unit distance apart, how much have they slid past each other? Well, we could just do a cross multiplication and we could get this as delta x divided by L. This tells us how much two planes which are a unit distance apart have slid past each other. And this is what we call as shear strain or shearing strain. And notice you could also calculate this number for these two planes, you'll get the same answer. Notice that if you take these two planes, this would be delta x, this would be L, and this divided by this is the same as this divided by this because they are similar triangles. Another way to think about this could be by taking this angle. If we call this as the angle of shear or the angle by which this thing has twisted, then notice that if you take this triangle or this triangle, then the ratio turns out to be the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. Opposite side by the adjacent side. So we could just call this as tan of the shearing angle. Well, one last thing we'll do to understand shearing perfectly is we'll understand major differences between shearing and tension and compression. So if you wanted to say compress this particular this particular rod, then you, you would have pushed it this way maybe. This would be the push that would have done. Now comes the question, what would these planes be doing under the compression? What would happen to them? Well, let's just shift this a little bit towards the right. Let's make a little bit of room. I'm running out of place over here. All right. So again, if we draw these planes, so imagine that's over here. It's a little crowded, please excuse the drawing, but if I draw the bottom plane over here and the top plane over here, over here, and you're pushing down on it, then what would happen to the plane is they would, they would get pushed close to each other, and as a result, there would be a restoring force acting this way, this way. So the major difference that you see between compression and shearing is that in compression, the planes come close to each other and maybe in tension, the planes go farther away from each other, but in shearing, they don't do that. In shearing, they just slide past each other. And notice, if you look at the restoring force, the restoring force is perpendicular to the area. Even when it's come to tension, if you had tension over here, the restoring force would be downward, again, perpendicular to the area. But notice over here, the restoring force is parallel to the area. Right, that is the major difference that you see between shearing and compression and tension. So the restoring force over here is parallel, parallel to area. Now when I try to tear this paper, notice that the way I put the force is this way and this way. Now consider a plane which is parallel to this force. So it'll be something, something like this, parallel to this force this way, and this plane will run along, it'll run along this length, and it'll have a very tiny width. And that width is so tiny because the thickness is so small. So the plane would be a rectangular one shown like this, it would be like this. And the area of this plane is incredibly tiny. And that's all because it has a very tiny width. 
And because this area is so tiny, even a modest force is going to produce a huge shear stress on this paper. The stress is so huge that the paper can't handle it. And that's why it just tears. All right, let's end with what really fascinates me about this. I used to always think that scissors would cut paper this way. But guess what? They don't do it that way. Instead, they cut it this way. The two prongs are not aligned. As you can see here, that's the key. This is how a scissor puts a huge sheer stress on the paper, just like how we do it when we are tearing it, and ends up cutting the paper. So next time you are using a scissor to cut a paper, remember, you are shearing it.